Well, friends, thank you for your welcome. It's so good to be here and wonderful to be getting to know a few of you and catching up with some old friends. This is a privilege and a joy. Uh, I did warn Dr. House, and this is of the three lectures now that remain. This is probably uh, the meatiest of them. So I, I will ask you to sort of mentally gird up your loins um, for a little bit of a journey, and then I will, I will make the, I won't quite make a promise, I will signal my intention that the two that follow will be slightly lighter fare. Um, but what I want to do in this lecture is to try and give a definition to preaching. And, and in a sense, I'm, I'm referring back a little bit to the book that Dr. Housen mentioned, Preaching in the New Testament, a biblical and the, um, a, an exegetical and biblical theological study, which was published with IVP. I'm, I'm giving in a sense a praise of some of the arguments there um, related to what preaching is. Um, and so if you feel entirely lost in the things that I'm saying now, you could, you could reference the book, although I'm always hesitant to suggest people read my books, but, but the, the material is there. Um, I would love to say a word of prayer as we enter into this next session. God, our Father, we thank you for the privilege of this time together today and the happiness of the fellowship that we're enjoying. Thank you for all that we share together in common in Christ. We pray that this hour now would be edifying and useful in grounding us in the task that you have called us to. We pray it for the honor and glory of our Savior in his name. Amen. In the preface to his famous series of lectures to Westminster Seminary in 1969 on the subject of preaching and preachers, Martin Lloyd-Jones marvels, I quote, at the readiness of certain young ministers to advise their brethren on preaching, and says that he himself only felt a degree of willingness to do so because he had spent 40 years in the pulpit and was given a long time, a period of six weeks over which to del deliver his lectures. Reading that afresh some time ago, left me with the distinct impression that the good doctor might disprove of today's exercise. A relatively young man having the audacity to speak on preaching within the circumference of a single day. But nevertheless, we venture here where perhaps angels fear to tread. I have taken my title for today uh, from the heart of the text to the heart of the hearer. That journey in preaching, which I believe most, if not all of us here, would view as normative, as essential, really, for faithful preaching, that journey from the heart of the text of Scripture to the heart of the hearer, that presupposes something about the nature of the preacher's task. It presupposes that the job of the preacher is to get to the heart of the text, to open up the heart of the text, and then communicate its core message, the text's essential message, communicate that message in such a way that it reaches not only the ears and the mind, but the very heart of the hearer. This first uh, lecture is concerned simply to answer the question, what is preaching? You and I may feel that we have an instinctive or even a considered answer to that question at the ready. But I think a moment's reflection on it gives us pause. And it indicates to us that there is more to the question than actually meets the eye. And so I hope we can open up the question a little bit together and give consideration to it. It's not our purpose today, of course, to survey church history on the theme of preaching, but I would observe from my own vantage point that it seems that recent decades have seen a movement of a return in some measure to some key Reformation principles when it comes to the handling of Scripture. Biblical exposition, preaching that really does seek to get to the heart of the text and open up the text on its own terms, biblical exposition as a mainstay of pulpit ministry has become normalized once again in many circles in Great Britain, 
and in the United States, and in a growing measure here in Canada, too. I, I sense and I believe that most gathered here today would share a commitment to biblical expository preaching. I think I'm right about that. I'm meeting more and more young people who are coming into ministry, who believe in biblical exposition, who want to preach the word on its own terms. But as a commitment to biblical exposition, as a method for preaching, as a foundation for preaching, has become more and more entrenched in many circles recently, I have sensed that another question is moving to the fore, a, a question that cuts to the heart of our theme today. And that question essentially is this, is preaching, as we might commonly understand it, public, authoritative, heralding? of the word of God by a leader within the church, pulpit preaching, if you like, is that actually a distinct ministry according to scripture? Is it biblically mandated as a practice? Or is it in actual fact simply a piece of our Christian cultural heritage that we have assumed as being normative, but for which there is very little theological basis? Now, I don't know what the scene is like in your particular context. I became attuned to these questions while serving in ministry in the United Kingdom, where something of a revival of biblical expository preaching had taken place some years before through the ministries of people like John Stott and Dick Lucas, where this second question now was very much in the air. And I sense that it's, it's probably in play elsewhere, too. And if I had to guess why this second question is in the air in some circles, I think the reason, as far as I can tell, is actually a very, very heartening one. I'm encouraged by it on one level, and it's this. There has been a tremendous growth in every member ministry in churches that are deeply committed to the Word. It's interesting. I've, Dr. Reed kindly mentioned my grandfather, who was 101, uh, who began his ministry, I guess, in the 1940s uh, and served a number of churches in the United Kingdom. But uh, one, one church he served was uh, Charlotte Baptist Chapel in Edinburgh, which some of you may have, may have heard of. At the time, I think it was the largest Baptist church in the United Kingdom. They had about 1,000 members, which for, for Great Britain in the 1950s, that was a mega church. Um, and when he served there, he was the only full-time member of staff. Uh, there was a part-time deaconess who assisted with some administrative matters. And the ministry, the expectation was that the ministry would by and large be done by the solo pastor. It's very interesting. That is not the situation in churches of that size today anywhere that I'm aware of, nor should it be, of course. We have, I think, a healthier, frankly, vision of every member ministry and a shared ministry not simply a one-person ministry. Many churches around the world and in the West and here in Canada have been taking seriously the truth that all God's people, his spirit-filled people, are able to understand and speak the word of God. Many churches are rejecting a clericalism that reserves all ministry for ordained leaders, but instead are rejoicing in the dynamic that Paul sets out. For instance, in Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, we won't turn to it, but you know the passage where the risen and ascended Christ gives gifts to the church. And what are the gifts he gives to the church? Shepherds and teachers who are given not to do all the work of ministry themselves, oh no, but to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And when that is happening in healthy and in wonderful ways throughout the week in a vibrant church, a question then naturally arises, doesn't it? What is special, what is distinctive about the pulpit ministry that happens on Sunday in the gathering? What is theologically distinctive about that? In fact, isn't it just a, an unhelpful clericalism to elevate the pulpit. 
Doesn't that just diminish the ministry carried out by the saints throughout the week in their varied callings? I think that is a question that is naturally being asked in our age in evangelicalism. And I think it's probably being stoked by our culture's wider disdain for authority. A natural cultural preference for informal and quote-unquote authentic conversation rather than public and rather more distant declaration. Now, I should acknowledge, of course, that many are not asking these questions. Not everyone's asking them. Many of us here will no doubt hold instinctively a convictionally high view of preaching, and we won't be particularly troubled by these concerns in particular. But given the centrality of preaching in the life of the church and in the work of the ministry, the question is important, isn't it, in its own right? What is preaching according to Scripture? Does it have a defined character? Is there a theological mandate to preach today? Now, I should preface all that I'm going to say by way of answer to that question uh, by saying that I don't feel I have a complete answer to the question. I don't know if that's a very depressing way to start a lecture but it is honest. I've spent a certain amount of time probing Scripture for answers to these questions, and I feel that I've found much help within the New Testament documents themselves, in particular in thinking about the question and moving toward an answer, but I do feel as well there is more work to be done here. So I hope, I would be delighted, uh, if some, even in this room, might feel inspired to take up the mantle, pursue the question further, and write a stunning PhD, which I will be very, very interested in to read in due course. So I look forward to that. But apart from what I've found so far in the scriptures, let me offer and propose four characteristics of preaching that give shape to its place in the life and ministry of the church. Four characteristics of preaching from the scriptures, I hope. Here is the first one, point number one. It's rather long. I'll say it twice. <laughs> preaching stands in a biblical theological line of continuity with prophetic ministry throughout redemptive history. If that was a sermon point, the pastor would probably get fired, but <laughs> I'm a visitor and I'm leaving later today. So I'll just say it again. Preaching stands in a biblical theological line of continuity with prophetic ministry throughout redemptive history. I'll explain what I mean by that. That is... Preaching fits into a long-standing pattern of God's modus operandi for communicating his truth. Preaching was not simply a flash in the pan in Lloyd-Jones's London of the 1950s, of Calvin's Geneva in the 1550s, or indeed of Jesus's Galilee in the first century AD. It is part of a bigger, wider, and deeper pattern within the purposes of God. Now, God being God, he is free to communicate by whatever means he should choose. And of course, he has communi communicated by a variety of means throughout redemptive history, but there is a clear pattern. There is something normative in his tendency to address an assembled crowd through a designated agent and to do so in a public and an authoritative way. In the Old Testament, this activity is tied to the prophetic office in an essential way. And, and we see it happening quite consistently throughout the broad sweep of redemptive history. There are, of course, periods of time where this does not take place. But those periods would be viewed as periods of darkness, actually, even of judgment. This pattern, it is grounded, in a sense, founded in the person and work of Moses. Moses' great sermon to the congregation of Israel recorded in Deuteronomy is really the foundational great sermon of the Bible. And there is a real sense in which this great sermon or series of sermons defines and shapes the redeemed nation and people of God. It is something of a national charter document. Within the great sermon... Moses famously sets out the expectation that the prophetic office will continue and find fulfillment in a great prophet like him yet to come. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up from you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him 
you shall listen. A great prophet's coming. The Old Testament prophets who follow Moses are in a substantial sense placeholders along the way, giving partial and intermediate fulfillment to that promise until the day that the great prophet like Moses should arrive sent from God. Their ministries would be varied, of course, and there would be a significant element to them that would be personal rather than publicly declarative. Prophets like Elijah and Elisha would often speak personally to a king rather than stand publicly and declare God's truth to the crowd. But there would be a public element to the prophetic task. And certainly the prophets were very, very public figures. Much of the content of the prophetic writings is addressed to the nation as a whole. That's very Uh, That's the case very often in Isaiah, for instance. He addresses the people, the nation, the coastland, Zion itself. We don't always have much detail concerning the immediate context and mode of delivery. Often we simply have the oracle itself recorded. But when we read those oracles that operate on a national and even a global scale, we rightly imagine, don't we, a public declaration of the word. I think it's natural to see the great prophetic books of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel as distilling and representing significant ministries of public declaration of the word of God, ministries that span many years. Occasionally, we are given more direct glimpses into the delivery of the prophetic word, but not often. In Haggai, for instance, we are told of Haggai addressing addressing the governor the high priest, and all the remnants of the people in Jerusalem, if you remember that wonderful little book, in what is certainly a public gathering, and we read of a public response to the public declaration as well. And here I read from Haggai chapter 1 and verse 13. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. What a, what a wonderful thing for Haggai, the preacher, to see as the Lord stirs up the people in response to the proclaimed word. The prophetic ministry was vital to the life of the nation of the people of God over the centuries. It was clearly at the heart of God's plans and his purposes. It was central to the way in which he communicated his promises to the nation. It issued his rebukes to them, gave his encouragements for their good. The prophetic office and the prophetic ministry was at the very heart of the redemptive plan of God. The Old Testament canon, it closes with the promise that Elijah the prophet will come before the day of the Lord. So we expect another prophetic word. And then there's a period of of silence, as you know, four centuries or so. And I guess that period of prophetic silence must have felt a long and very, very difficult period, really a worrisome period for the people in the nation. No prophetic word, no declaration from God, no fresh instruction, encouragement, or promise, no rebuke. The period of waiting comes to an end, of course, and the New Testament opens with the revival of the prophetic office, John the Baptist. He appears and is clearly the promised Elijah. He looks like a prophet. He speaks like a prophet. And Jesus himself says of John that if the people would accept it, you remember the line, he is the Elijah who was to come. Matthew 11 and verse 14. John's role is unquestionably that of announcing, introducing, paving the way for the greater one who was to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so once John has announced Jesus' arrival, the great prophet is himself now on the scene and the focus shifts to Jesus and John fades away from view. I don't know if you've ever thought about this much, but Jesus introduces himself as a prophet, more than a prophet, when he reads from the scroll of Isaiah in chapter 6 in Luke 4 in the synagogue of Nazareth, declaring that the Spirit of the Lord, 61, declaring that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These paradigmatic words are, 
for the ministry of Jesus, they point, don't they, to a clearly proclamatory ministry and linking himself to the prophet of old, to Isaiah like that, points to a clearly prophetic ministry for Jesus. But what is almost more interesting is the way in which Jesus follows up that reading. Having made that first impression on the people, Jesus goes on to note this about his ministry and how it's going to be received. Luke chapter 4 and verse 24. Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Now, a whole lot more could be said on this. And we could develop it further, but a key part of Jesus' self-presentation is as the very fulfillment of the great prophetic office. Now, in terms of our biblical theology, I don't think that that is a very controversial point to make, that Jesus fulfills the great office of prophet. I think that's what the author to, Hebrews is, uh, to the Hebrews is getting at when he opens his discourse by declaring, you remember long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. There's a great prophetic history here. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by or in his son. In and through the person of the son comes the culmination of the prophetic office and of the prophetic word. But what is interesting, as we trace the biblical theological line of fulfillment of the prophetic office to Jesus Christ, as we must, what is quite interesting is what takes place the other side of that fulfillment in the person of Christ. The prophetic word is spoken fully in him. There is nothing more to add to the message, and yet something of the prophetic function now of declaring this final word of fulfillment, something of the prophetic function continues. There is a kind of perpetuation, an entrusting of the prophetic task that takes place within the Gospels and within the epistles as well in the New Testament. So, when Jesus sends his disciples out on mission in Luke 9, his instruction to them was not to make material provisions for themselves Rather, his instruction to them not to make material provisions for themselves, those instructions evoke and recall Elijah's own experience in 1 Kings 17. When Jesus sends out the 12 in Matthew 10, he more or less designates them prophets or prophetic representatives, at very least in verse 40 of Matthew 10. Whoever receives you, you remember this, receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Very intriguing, isn't it? When the Spirit is given in Acts 2 to the people of Christ, you will remember the words of Joel that Peter quotes to explain what was taking place in the declaration of the word of God in all these different languages, wonderful thing taking place. And he says, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, prophesy. The disciples of Jesus have a prophetic ministry as they declare the final and the authoritative prophetic word, the gospel of the great prophet himself. The apostles, as servants of the great prophet, have a mandate from him to declare the words. But that's not all. The function and the role does not stop dead with the apostles and with the close of the apostolic age. The epistles give evidence that this work and this function are to continue in some measure. Paul, in particular, gives some indication that he sees himself as standing in the prophetic tradition in his own calling, his own ministry, we see this at a number of points, but let me just mention 2 Corinthians briefly because it's quite wonderful, and in part because I want to return and give some sustained attention to 2 Corinthians in a few minutes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul establishes quite a sustained comparison and contrast between himself and Moses, if you remember, as covenant ministers. 
And, and the, the surrounding language within this section uh, makes it clear that Paul has his preaching ministry in view in this comparison. Actually, I say that Paul establishes this comparison and this contrast between himself and Moses. In fact, Paul has both himself and some of his non-apostolic preaching associates in view as well here. And this point is quite significant. In chapter 1 and verse 19, he explicitly mentions the fact that Silvanus and Timothy are part of the preaching team that he refers to here. Just notice it there, 119, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed, we preached among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, who was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. Paul and his preaching associates have a different ministry to that of Moses. Theirs is a new covenant ministry with a greater revelation of glory attached to it. But the discussion makes it clear that there are key points of similarities. The ministries are both public, verbal, proclamatory, and they both facilitate the revelation of God's glory, if to differing degrees. Added to the Moses comparison, Paul also sets their ministry in some degree of parallel or better continuity, even salvation historical fulfillment with that of the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 6 in verse 1, he says of their work as, amb as ambassadors of Christ that through him, Christ is issuing his own appeal. Working together with him, with Christ then, chapter 6 and verse 1, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. And now he cites God's appeal first issued in Isaiah 49 and verse 8. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. In reissuing this appeal, Paul locates his ministry as standing in a line of continuity, doesn't he, with that of the prophet Isaiah. God makes an appeal through them both, and Paul concludes that now, now, as he as, and his associates speak in the age of fulfillment, in the church's age, in the gospel age, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Haifman rightly says that this use of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, together with its declaration of fulfillment, is one of the strongest assertions of Paul's strategic role within the history of redemption. Paul, like Isaiah, speaks for God, and God speaks through Paul. Here in 2 Corinthians, Paul makes it clear that his preaching ministry, his prophetic ministry, if you like, is shared with his non-apostolic associates. But the dynamic of this handing over of ministry to now the post-apostolic servants of the word is perhaps clearest in 2 Timothy. Paul's charge to Timothy in this respect is particularly significant and noteworthy for us. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul wants to remind Timothy of the sufficiency of the scriptures for his ministry in Ephesus. And he says this, familiar words, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Term man of God there. I don't know if you've given consideration to it. The term which Paul uses is often popularly interpreted as meaning the Christian person. Uh, every believer, any believer. But you know, the, the Old Testament pedigree of the term indicates that it is more specialized. The man of God in the Old Testament, as this term is used in the Septuagint, is typically the speaker of God's word, normally the prophet, occasionally the king. It is not a generalized term, but rather a specific term referring to God's authoritative agent who is sent to declare his word. Now, having reminded Timothy, the man of God, of the sufficiency of the scriptures for his ministry, Paul then charges him to use those scriptures to exercise the ministry that he has been given as a man of God. Chapter 4 and verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Verse 2. 
this role of making the authoritative public declaration of the word of God. It is handed down from Jesus to the apostles and to post-apostolic leaders like Timothy. And that's very, very important. And as we place the work of preaching within its whole biblical theological context, we see that God has been pleased to use this type of ministry throughout redemptive history to issue his own appeal, to make himself known. And so as we think of preaching of this public and authoritative heralding of the word of God, as we think about it within its appropriate biblical theological context, we are thinking of a distinctive form of word ministry that has been a feature of God's dealings with humanity throughout biblical history. So that's the first characteristic of preaching. Preaching stands in a biblical, theological line of continuity with prophetic ministry throughout redemptive history. Here's the second one. This one's shorter. You could almost preach this. Preaching uniquely reflects the nature of the gospel. Preaching uniquely reflects the nature of the gospel. The power of the word of God is such that simply through reading it, anyone could come to faith in new life. The power of the gospel is such that a faltering explanation of it by a believing child to their unbelieving friend on the school bus can lead to salvation and new life. God's word is not constrained in any way by human weakness, nor confined to any mode of delivery. But all that having been said, there is something special, isn't there, about preaching as a mode of communicating the gospel. There is a particular way in which the public heralding of the gospel uniquely reflects the nature of the gospel itself. There is a general logic to that claim, I believe, but the idea is grounded in particular in what Paul has to say about the hearing of faith in Romans chapter 10, and you might like to glance there. And I will too. It is, of course, a familiar passage. In its broader context, Romans 10 addresses the concern that God might have rejected Israel. Paul laments the fact that his brothers are ignorant of the righteousness of God and have sought to establish their own, chapter 10 and verse 3. Drawing on Moses' words in Deuteronomy 30, Paul speaks of the righteousness that comes by faith, the righteousness of the gospel, and notes that the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up to the, from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. And quoting the words of Joel 2 and verse 32, he caps off his argument by declaring that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Faith is about hearing and believing and then calling. That's the dynamic at the very heart of the gospel, and we know that. Righteousness is not something that we go down to the abyss to pursue or that we seek to rest from heaven itself. No, Jesus has come down. Jesus has died. Jesus has risen. Jesus is ascended. And through his all-sufficient and complete work, righteousness is now available to us as a gift. It is right here. It is near us. It is in our mouth as we speak the gospel. It is in our heart as we believe the gospel. That is the powerful dynamic of the gospel. But in Paul's relentless logic, and his logic is wonderful, isn't it? It is relentless. That then all raises a key question for us, or a key series of questions, which are central to our concern and to our discussion here today. Allow me just to read from verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Down to verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing. Righteousness is given to us as a message, and that message is preached by agents, by Paul and by others who will be sent, just as Moses and Isaiah proclaimed the word of God to Israel. There's huge value 
in having discussions about the gospel, even debates, and engaging in apologetics in the public square, in having home Bible studies where a group can chew over a passage together. But, but let me say this, none of this can or should replace the public declaration, the proclamation, the heralding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As the preacher stands before the people and declares what God has achieved in Christ, as the preacher holds out the gospel, the word of faith that is near us now, and as a group of people simply listen. Don't don't add anything to the message themselves. Don't debate it. Don't dispute it. Just listen. Within that event... And within that dynamic, there is a reflection of the fact that the gospel is something given by God to be received by faith with no works added. It reflects the fact that God's work in Christ is all sufficient and you and I simply receive. You know, in a society where no teacher is to be trusted, where no truth is to be accepted without all scrutiny and verification, where most authority figures are actually now despised, where everyone is an expert and no one is an expert, there will be constant pressure upon us to set aside the public heralding of the word of God. But it seems to me anyway, from what Paul says here in Romans 10, that this declaration of the gospel and this hearing of the gospel is normative and ought to be prioritized must be preserved. As an aside, it's worth noting that the public declaration of God's word as a mode of communication of his message, it it is a mode that transcends time and culture. Very significantly, it transcends barriers of literacy. You know, the inductive group Bible study and theological discussion, which is so common and wonderfully so. I love a good inductive Bible study, and we run plenty of them at our church. Particularly common, I think, within urban churches and college settings. It's not something that actually works everywhere. Anywhere that is, uh, it, where, where people aren't able to engage in that kind of study where you don't have a literate group, perhaps, to whom you're ministering. It's not, it's not feasible everywhere and not effective. But the preaching of the word of God, the public uh, declaration of his truth, now that is something that works anywhere. Anywhere, that is, that the Spirit of God softens the heart to enable a listening and a reception. It works at any time, in any place, in any culture, among any group of people, no matter what their educational level. In his uh, delightful book, Expository Exaltation, John Piper makes the point very well. He writes this, and let me quote from him. Nothing can replace preaching. Books are wonderful. Who has not been deeply affected by a great book? Lectures and discussions and drama and poetry and film and paintings are powerful. But any effort to replace preaching with anything else will sooner or later fail. People have tried experiments that replace preaching. Marginal, disillusioned people flock to the experiment. It lasts a few years, and then it dies. Meanwhile, preaching goes on from decade to decade and century to century. Why? Because God has created and appointed this unique, anointed embodiment of his word for the explanation and celebration of his glory and his worth. It had to end like that with with dear John Piper and how right he is. Third, the preaching of the word of God becomes a special means of effecting an encounter between God and his people. Sorry, I should have alliterated and made them rhyme or something. Let me read that again. (laughs) Third, the preaching of the word of God becomes a special means of effecting an encounter between God and his people. That claim takes a little bit of unpacking, but I think many of us will find that it resonates with our experience of sitting under the preaching of the word. And perhaps it gives articulation to some of our hopes and our prayers for what the Lord might graciously do through our preaching. 
No, no doubt, we've all had that experience, haven't we, of sitting under the preaching of the Word of God and no, knowing, just knowing, that we have heard the Lord speak to us powerfully through His Word, of sensing that the Lord has been with us and we've met with Him in a special way by His Spirit, of leaving the gathering of the people of God at the end of the service, feeling and knowing that we have met with the Lord Himself, if you ever experienced that. It's a wonderful thing. Now, it's challenging to articulate exactly what we mean by all that and what are the true spiritual dynamics taking place within that, but I expect most of us will know something of that experience in the kindness of God. But we have to ask, as Bible people, we have to ask, is that kind of experience tied to the act of preaching in any particular way in Scripture Or is what I have just described experientially simply a function actually of the nature of the Word of God itself? So that we might have that kind of experience simply by reading the Word to ourselves in private. Is this really something, according to Scripture, which is tied to preaching itself? Well, I think we can overstate the case perhaps, and I think it would be easy to fall into speculation or fanciful assertion, but I do see in Scripture some strong indications that an experience of an encounter with the Word of with God by His Word, rather, is especially facilitated by the preaching of the Word. God can meet with His people any way He likes, anywhere He likes, but I think Scripture gives us reason to see that He is pleased to do this in a special way through preaching. Now, to consider this together, I'd like to try to look together, especially at 2 Corinthians and Hebrews. Let me start with 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. I mentioned earlier that in this letter, Paul gives something of a window into his understanding of his role and the role of his associates within the purposes of God as preachers. A somewhat self-conscious focus on their own ministry, on Paul's own ministry, makes sense in the wider context of the Corinthian correspondence. And just think about what's going on in Corinth and in the correspondence. You remember that the Corinthian Christians have become rather mixed up and confused, to put it politely, following after other leaders drawn by the so-called super apostles. And part of what Paul is doing in 2 Corinthians is to show the Corinthians what godly, genuine, new covenant ministry looks like. And at the heart of that discussion, no surprise, comes the preaching of the Word of God. I'm going to focus on chapter 3 in a moment, but just to observe that a preaching ministry is in view here, notice with me some of the wider context of the discussion. Notice again verse 19 of chapter 1, I already referred to it. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed, whom we preached, the verb here is the classic heralding verb, keruso, whom we preached, Silvanus, Timothy, and I, was not yes and no, but in him it was always yes. As speakers of God's word, Paul and his associates spread the knowledge of him, and Paul gives a vivid picture of that proclamatory work, chapter 2 and verse 14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Their ministry of speaking the word, of spreading the fragrance of the knowledge of him, that's what's in view. The imagery of a procession, verse 14, is quite wonderful, suggests a public, speaking of the word, this is a public event, a a spectacle, as it were. So here we're thinking primarily, although not necessarily exclusively, about their preaching. And then as well, just to set the context, notice with me the opening of chapter 4. Therefore, having this ministry, the ministry he describes in chapter 3, the ministry we will look at presently, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God, down to verse 4, for what we proclaim 
Again, that's the same heralding verb, keruso. What we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, all this is to say, all this is to say that Paul has his own and his associates preaching ministry in mind here in this section. In chapter 3, where I now want to focus for a moment, he engages in a comparison between their new covenant ministry and the ministry of Moses and those who followed him under the old covenant. The new covenant ministry, it comes with a greater glory, Paul insists, verses 7 through 11. Old covenant ministry, it had its glory, but new covenant ministry comes with a greater glory. And we pick up the discussion there and read from verse 12. Paul writes this, Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who had put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now remember, Paul is speaking about a new covenant ministry that has been entrusted to him and to his associates, a preaching ministry in particular, as we see at the start of the next chapter. And within this ministry, he says, there is freedom, verse 17. This freedom for the preacher means a special boldness, verse 12, a parasia, a freedom of speech, a freedom for the preacher to proclaim, but more than that, a freedom for the preacher and the listener now, verse 18, for all of us, and this is really wonderful, don't miss this, for all of us, verse 18, to behold the glory of the Lord without a veiled face, and then to be transformed by the power of his spirit from one degree of glory to another. The ministry of proclamation under the new covenant involves and effects a display of the glory of God in Jesus Christ, a degree of glory that is not displayed in its fullness under the old covenant. And when this new covenant word is proclaimed, God is at work revealing his glory to speaker and hearer alike. And when God reveals his glory, what happens? His people are transformed. And as we listen into that description of what Paul is saying, I think our hearts resonate, don't they? I expect we recall occasions when we've sat under the preaching of the word or when we have preached the word ourselves and we have in some sense, in some measure, felt that we have beheld the glory of God. We have left the assembly of God's people that day having been changed by the encounter. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's more that could be said from 2 Corinthians, but I'm aware of time and we've got to move on. Hebrews carries something of this sense of encounter as well. Hebrews is a very fascinating document to consider when it comes to preaching. Fascinating, especially because there is a good case to be made that Hebrews is itself a sermon. I won't pursue that line of argument in detail. There's plenty of discussion of that in the secondary literature now, though there wasn't 20 years ago. Of course, it is the case that many people, uh, rather that, that many, perhaps all the epistles, The epistles were designed to be read out to the churches. But there are reasons to think that Hebrews, in terms of its genre, was essentially a sermon that was written down and sent, rather than essentially a letter that was designed to be read out, if that makes sense, if that distinction makes any sense. The lack of an epistolary prescript is one indication of that in Hebrews. Certain rhetorical figures, uh, features add to the impression, and the writer's own description of the document as a word of exhortation, chapter 13, verse 22, adds to that sense. As we know from Acts 13 and elsewhere, that term was used to refer to the sermon in a synagogue and, into the early, and in the early church. We'll pursue that now 
more. But if we take for a moment the idea that Hebrews is or might be a sermon, and if we imagine this document being preached to an assembled congregation, well, that places certain of its statements in a particular light for us. There can be little doubt that the writer, or rather, let's call him the preacher, carries the conviction that he is speaking God's own word to the people. But more than that, it is quite clear that he believes that through his sermon, God himself is speaking and God's own voice is going to be heard. In chapters 3 and 4, you'll remember that the writer famously and repeatedly issues the appeal from Psalm 95. You remember it well. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. But what takes place in the hearing of the sermon is not merely a hearing of God's voice that informs or even exhorts. It is actually a kind of judicial encounter with God the judge. At the start of chapter 4, the writer reminds the people that back in the wilderness, the people of God heard the declaration of good news, of covenant promises. And I think actually the declaration of those promises by Joshua and Caleb in Numbers 14 is in view there. But anyway, the people heard God's word of promise, but they did not believe and so could not enter the rest of God. And the writer says to them in chapter 4, the promise is open to you. You have the opportunity to hear God's voice. And if you will respond in faith to what you are hearing now, you can enter God's rest. But, but be warned an unbelieving response to God's voice will mean judgment. So today, there is today an opportunity to respond in faith or in disobedience. There is an opportunity, if you like, to live or to die. The stakes are high. This is a judicial encounter with God himself. In Hebrews 12, there's a strong sense of encounter as well. The writer speaks of the congregation as a people who have gathered, it's wonderful, isn't it, in the heavenly Zion through Christ their mediator. And as they are a people gathered even now in Zion, gathered with the heavenly ecclesia, with the heavenly congregation, verse 23 of chapter 12, while that happens, this earthly congregation is in the presence of Jesus, verse 24. And as they are there, and as they listen to the preaching, as an assembly here on earth, they are hearing the message of the very blood of Jesus, verse 24. And as they listen, the preacher appeals to the people, to the listening congregation, to see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. And if you ask the congregation, I mean, just picture it and imagine, and if you ask the congregation in the immediate experience, as they are sitting listening to the sermon, you ask them the question, whose voice are you hearing? Well, in an immediate sense, of course, it is the preacher's voice they hear. That's, that's, what they're, that's what's going through their eardrums. But verse 26 makes it clear that in an, in an ultimate sense, it is the voice of the Lord whose voice previously shook the earth at Sinai. The gathering on earth to hear the preaching of the word, well, it is a gathering in the presence of Christ and the voice of God himself is heard. It is, if you like, a foretaste, a proleptic experience of heaven itself. And that makes sense of one of the great refrains of the letter. In two eloquent and quite moving passages, as he speaks God's word to the people, as he preaches it, The preacher invites the people and calls the people to draw near to Christ, to approach the throne of grace. He does it at the end of chapter 4, and he does it again at the end of chapter 10. And the language that he uses for this approach is worship language, it's temple language, tabernacle language. The people who hear the voice of God are invited to come near, to draw near to the God who is speaking to them, even to approach him in his sanctuary. Friends, preaching is not simply the transfer of information about God. It's not simply the impartation of divine truth. Authentic, faithful, biblical preaching of the word of God is a special means by which God draws his people into his presence and encounters his people and allows us to encounter him. And that encounter with God in his glory is for us a transformative experience. 
encounter. Fourth and finally and briefly, the preaching of the word of God as acts as an engine for the other ministries of the word. Let me say that again. The preaching of the word of God acts as an engine for the other ministries of the word. In a sense, this final concluding point brings us back to where we began. The question of the relationship between preaching and other ministries of the word within the local church. What we have seen so far tells us that preaching is a distinctive ministry of the word, but it does not stand alone as a solitary ministry of the word. It is not hermetically sealed off from the other word ministries that do take place within the local assembly. Far from it. In fact, there are strong indications in the New Testament that the declarative public preaching of the word by the leaders of the church should direct and should fuel the other ministries of the church throughout the fellowship. I think there can be this concern that if we have an elevated view of preaching, we will end up with a diminished view of the other ministries of all believers within the fellowship. But nothing we've thought about or looked at today should diminish the word ministries of every believer within the fellowship. The New Testament has plenty to say about these varied ministries. And the basic dynamic already mentioned that Paul sets out in Ephesians 4 leads us to expect that the word ministry of the pastor teacher should stimulate the ministry of the whole church family. The risen and ascended Christ in Ephesians 4 Verse 11, gave the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And and it's no surprise then that a number of key passages in the New Testament where we learn about the ministry of the saints to build up the body, it's no surprise to find that their ministry flows from and relates to the preaching ministry of pastor teachers. I mentioned already Colossians 3.16 Uh, with reference to Colossians 1.28 and the parallelism there. I won't rehearse that again. I think we see the same dynamic at play in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14, where Paul writes there to the believers, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, etc., The congregation's leaders who are over them in the Lord have the responsibility to admonish them from the word of God. Same language as Colossians, actually, and the whole church family. Well, they are to now admonish one another and bring biblical encouragement to one another. It's the same dynamic we see in Colossians. In the same vein, the passage we thought about in Hebrews 3 to 4, when the people hear the word of God, they need to respond in faith. The people of old, they heard God's voice in the wilderness as Joshua spoke covenant promises and covenant hope to them. The people of the Hebrews letter are hearing God's voice as the preacher expounds his word. And notice how the preacher exhorts the congregation to help one another. Chapter 3 and verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But here's what you do. Exhort one another, encourage one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Within Hebrews, to encourage one another means to bring the encouragement of the word of God. And the people are then to be reinforcing what has come from the writer's own sermon, his word of encouragement. They help one another to remember, to internalize, to live out what they have heard. We can see the same dynamic in Titus. I won't pause to do that now, but I could mention it later for those who are interested. But the point is this, the ministry of the pastors and teachers, the public declaration of the word of God, it's not hermetically sealed off from the other ministries of the word, no far from it. At the same time, though, it is distinct. There is a vital, dynamic relationship between preaching and other ministries of the word. The preaching on Sunday from the pulpit, it drives and feeds and it gives shape to the word ministry that happens throughout the fellowship. Friends, there is more that we could say more that we could explore on the subject of the theology of preaching, the definition of preaching, but at least that's the start. And the the, the implications 
that flow from the belief that preaching is God's specially chosen and appointed means for addressing his people, for drawing them into his presence, for calling us to respond to him in repentance and obedience and faith, for equipping the saints for the work of ministry. If we believe that this much and so much more else is true about preaching, all I really want to say is this. We need to continue to prize and prioritize the preaching of the word of God. If preaching has such a vital role, a dignified role in the church of Jesus Christ, then surely the greatest contribution that this institution can make to the church in our age is to produce preachers. And I'm so glad that that is the focus. I think we all know how easily seminaries lose sight of this and how easily seminaries struggle with it. Plenty of seminaries produce good theologians. Not all manage to produce good preachers. But how much the church in Canada today needs faithful, competent, godly, and gifted, prophetic, and powerful preachers of the word. I'd love to pray as we close that the Lord would uphold this institution and each one here in that great work. Let me pray. Our Father, we thank you for this privileged mandate that you give to those who are set apart to preach your word. We thank you for the vision of transformation and encounter with you and revelation of glory that comes through this great and noble public act. We pray for each one here who is a preacher that you would uphold him in his work and give him grace to exercise it faithfully. We pray for heritage as it seeks to raise up a new generation of preachers for our land. We pray that you would uphold this institution in faithfulness and in effectiveness in this great task. We pray these things with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you like me to stay up here or to, or to move away? Good. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Griffith. That was wonderful. Uh, a reminder for many of us who have been preaching for a while and hopefully helpful to those who are beginning their preaching ministries. A couple of things to note. Uh, we will be meeting back here at 1.30, and um, there is a partner church lunch, as I mentioned earlier, and that is over in the main building, room 201, and you are to gather there with Godfrey Thorogood. I think it would be worthwhile just saying right now that there is going to be another conference coming up in a week, and that is the Fuller, Andrew Fuller Lectures, and we have um, Kevin Flatt from Redeemer coming to uh, deal with or address the secularization of our world and how the gospel can speak into that. So we would greatly encourage you to come to that. That's October the 28th, Friday at 7 o'clock. All right. Uh, enjoy your lunch. Have a good time of fellowship. See you back here. <laughs>